Lord Goldsmith spoke uh, yesterday eloquently of the storm clouds that are brewing in our um, lovely world of international commercial arbitration, those that are affecting uh, the sense of integrity um, with which we conduct investor, investor state arbitrations and the concerns that we have about attacks upon investor state arbitration for its uh, supposed lack of integrity. Um, I'm going to speak about a different kind of concern about the integrity of the process, one that has, in a sense, not come from outside the international arbitration uh, community, but which is bubbling up from within it. And that is the first point about gorillas. So if we could have uh, the next slide. Um, as we uh, put our heads together year upon year in international conferences as arbitration practitioners to try to refine our processes to make them serve ever better um, our, the needs of the business community to be able to resolve disputes more efficiently and in a fairer way year upon year, we tend to overlook the possibility that there might have, uh, there might develop among us a growing cohort of people who wish not to fashion better rules to play by, but who wish to fashion ways to frustrate and interfere with the process uh, in a, in I, if, I, if I dare say, in a way that doesn't promote good conduct, but in fact engages in misconduct. So that is something that is new, that is arising as a concern for us in the international commercial arbitration community. Um, could we go back to the previous slide? Um, one of the uh, two new innovations uh, that uh, we've seen recently are innovations in the IBA guidelines, um, first on party representation and on conflict of interest. Let me just say just a brief word about uh, the IBA. The International Bar Association has created a number of instruments of soft law that have come to be used widely among the international commercial arbitration community. Uh, first, perhaps, and foremost of these is the IBA rules on the taking of evidence. That has gained so much uh, usage among international arbitrators that it is very, very commonly put into an early procedural order where the tribunal says, we are bound by the law, we are bound by the rules, whether they are the rules of the Biviac, or what it will ultimately be called, or the ICC, or whichever other institution. But they will say, we also wish the parties to accept that we will be guided by the IBA rules on the taking of evidence, which provide for certain other sort of guidelines for the approach to disclosure of information and for dealings uh, with witnesses and, and others. The IBA has also promulgated two other very important ones that I'll speak about today. The first is the guidelines on party representation, which are a new set of guidelines. You can find them on the IBA website. And they deal with sort of presumptions about the way uh, counsel in arbitration or representatives of parties will deal with one another and will deal with the tribunal. Uh, you will know from litigation that you have uh, rules of professional conduct that apply to you and govern the way in which you conduct yourself in your dealings with uh, witnesses and your dealings with the tribunal. These are an equivalent version for international arbitration. Uh, the IBA has also had, uh, since 2004, a series of guidelines on conflict of interest uh, for arbitrators. These are things that could give rise to concerns about the potential for an appearance of bias that could serve, in fact, a basis for a challenge. These guidelines have been revised in 2014. The common thread between these two uh, developments is that they both are responses to the possibility of misconduct that is beginning to emerge uh, time and again um, in uh, arbitrations around the world. So let's go to the next slide. In the guidelines on party representation, uh, the uh, working group has fashioned a series of examples of misconduct that could occur in the course of an arbitration. This is not, um, I, I want to, uh, to uh, emphasize here, that this is not a situation where parties are struggling to meet their obligations, struggling to fulfill their mandate, but where counsel are deliberately engaging in 
things that will frustrate the process, things that will make it more difficult for the tribunal to uh, fulfill its mandate and for the other party to represent its, cli its uh, client fairly. Here are some examples. Um, counsel may appear and may have been uh, declared on, on the record and then very late in the process, perhaps a, a week or two before the hearing, suddenly new counsel are announced. And surprise, surprise, the new counsel have uh, a conflict with one of the arbitration, the members of the panel. And what should happen there? Um, although you might say at the outset, well, uh, this arbitrator can or cannot serve because there is a conflict with one of the parties um, or because perhaps uh, they are, dare I say, from the same chambers or from the same law firm as one of the council members. Suddenly when that arises just a week or two before the hearing, you can imagine the uh, difficulty, the confusion that that can cause. Sometimes that's designed to happen, designed to create that very problem. Uh, Ex-party communications, an obvious uh, problem, where suddenly a party without uh, invitation starts to contact um, directly uh, the arbitrator that it has nominated, perhaps in advance of the hearing, perhaps during the hearing. Um, improper questions and in interviews. Uh, where you are considering, uh, a, considering whether or not to appoint a particular person as, or nominate a particular person as uh, an arbitrator, and you begin to canvass them in detail on the facts of the case and how they might uh, view those facts. Clearly that could create uh, an impropriety. Uh, presenting false evidence, that's only too obvious. Uh, con condoning destruction or suppression of evidence by a witness, again, an obvious uh, form of misconduct. Um, oppressive disclosure requests. Uh, what should be done about those uh, um, disclosure requests when they can slow the process, make it more difficult? Um, improper interference with written or oral evidence. Um, a witness who is about to appear and has been prepared dare I say, in inverted commas, uh, within an inch of, of his or her life, so that uh, there is a clear script to present to the tribunal. Um, or a witness statement that has never really uh, passed before the eyes of the witness, uh, except for the signature. Um, all of these things um, uh, are obvious examples of misconduct. Some of the examples, dare I say, are less obvious. Some examples where, for example, uh, the uh, disclosure is provided, but too late. Uh, a demand for um, an additional claim is added, but far beyond time. All of these things that could have the potential to drag things to a halt or just to simply make it dis difficult. Um, these things are potentially, in a particular conduct, uh, context, to be understood as misconduct. The question is, do we have any capacity to deal with that? And that's partly what the guidelines on party mis misrepresent, sorry, party representation um, were uh, designed to address. And so they have provided, in addition, uh, very specific remedies that the tribunal may have at its, uh, at its uh, disposal in order to address uh, this misconduct. Uh, an obvious thing is uh, tribunal members are reminded that they are able to admonish parties, to remind them of their responsibilities, and to let them know uh, that uh, they are not um, uh, um, being overlooked, uh, that this is recognized as uh, a difficulty for the tribunal and causing a difficulty for the process. Certainly to draw adverse inferences where, for example, a key piece of uh, evidence or a key witness fails to materialize in the proceedings, um, and it's obvious that that, uh, that, that uh, witness may be one that is harmful or may not assist the party who would have the capacity to produce that evidence or that witness. Um, the tribunal is uh, encouraged to consider the possibility of making costs awards in the course of the arbitration. That is, you know, for example, uh, something that is demanded late or provided late um, to the extent that that creates concerns, uh, a costs award uh, might be appropriate. Um, and to take, as, as I say, other appropriate measures to preserve the fairness and integrity of the proceedings. Well, once again, all of this 
sounds very good and well. And indeed, if we are all on the same page about uh, forever enhancing and improving uh, the quality of the process, the efficiency of the process, and the fairness of the process, this is all well and good. But when you are truly dealing with guerrilla tactics, there are further considerations uh, to, be, to be born. And they come up in a very unexpected way. And that is in the uh, guidelines on the conflict of interest. So pause what I've just been speaking about, speaking about for a moment and now turn to the guidelines on the conflict of interest. These have existed since 2004. They have been revised in 2014. And some of the interesting features of them deal with uh, the disclosable situations, the situations that a, a tribunal member or a potential tribunal member may have to disclose as creating the possibility of a conflict of interest. And you see here a repeated theme here in which enmity comes up or adversity comes up um, on the part of an arbitrator as against a party or as against counsel. Now I ask you, if you have a, a party representative before you who is repeatedly misbehaving or, as I sometimes say, engaging in shenanigans, that's a technical term, um, then the question becomes, what measures do you in fact have reasonably at your disposal before you will be accused of having enmity, before you will be regarded as having such adversity to the party representative that you will be considered to be in a position of conflict? And indeed, if you have been provoked beyond your sense of uh, good temper, you may be regarded in that way. So that is an ongoing concern for us. I will add that, I will finish on this one, and we won't get to talk about elves unless you wish to ask in the, in the, um, in the uh, question, uh, in the question period. Um, I will finish on this, that, um, that uh, in this respect, one of the strongest uh, bulwarks we have against this, and one of the weakest links against uh, this uh, concern um, exists very clearly in the quality of the judiciary. In many cases, these guerrilla tactics, in terms of their end game, are only designed to develop a record of a proceeding, a procedure of, a record of a procedure full of procedural rulings, full of concerns about procedural irregularities, full of concerns and demands for enhanced procedural fairness that are either answered or not answered by the tri tribunal so as to form a basis for a challenge to the award later. Now, the extent to which those challenges are taken up, you know, as a creed occur against procedural irregularities by uh, an inexperienced judiciary, one that is likely to be fooled into thinking, oh, well, this uh, party was not able to present that document, and therefore the entire award should be, uh, should be cast aside. To the extent that you've got an inexperienced or um, poorly educated judiciary, you are unable to resist this problem. To the extent that you have a very well-educated, a very sophisticated judiciary that is capable of sorting out these issues, capable of supporting the award where it needs to be supported, you are in good shape. So yes, indeed, you are in very good shape in the BVI, and I would encourage you to invest further in the infrastructure that you have, the human capital that you have, in two ways. One, through continuing to become, or becoming and continuing to become leaders in the field of judicial education within the region, just as you have started on that road. But second, it may have seemed to be seemed to have been quite um, a big uh, step to have a commercial court and a commercial court judge. I urge you to think of the next step, taking the next step, and that is two. Because, and you think that this is a small matter, but it's not. It's a very simple matter. You need to have the infrastructure. You need to let the world know, and the only 
true way you can do that is through road shows. And the only true way you can do that is to take along with you members of an educated judiciary. You need not one Judge Leon, you need two. <laughs>